I've admired this guy's playing before we even knew each other, and then uh, finally got to meet each other and play some music, and it just kind of started this long-time relationship of playing gigs, and I can't wait to talk about our history, find out more about him, and then just talk about some of the fun things that we've done over the years. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce my pal, Mr. George Sandler. Hey, buddy. Howdy doody. Howdy doody. It's good to see you, Brad. You know, I remember the first gig we did together and it was just like, it was like peas and carrots. It really was. Um, it really was. You know, so you, you may not know this, but sometime back in years ago, I was playing some uh, in a, in a gospel group around Atlanta. Uh, we were playing around Atlanta Southeast and, and they had at some point gone and done a, done an album that you played drums on. Was and that, was that at Lamp? It probably was at Lamp. Lamp music. Wow. Yeah. This would have been in like mid to late nineties. What I think is at Lamp or David or David, what's his name? Studio up in Woodstock, I think. I, you know. Yeah. So they brought the they brought the tracks back and we were listening to the tunes that we were going to learn from the from the record. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, who's that guy? Who's the the drum sounds so good. So I was reading the credits on it. and It was George Sandler. Oh, man, that's, and, that's, that's and, sweet. That's very sweet. So then the so fast forward to and we'll talk about it later that those crazy few gigs that we played with Tim Purcell with the goat. Uh, I'm sure we can talk about that. Um <laughs> I was I was uh, I was very nervous about playing a, with a gig with you. I was like, oh man, this guy is just gonna it's just gonna he's gonna think I'm a just a complete amateur. And we started playing, and man, it was just like love at first sight. Yeah, it was so it was. good. It truly was. And I remember you had that blue the blue music man. Yep, that's right. It, it, it was just like like well, I know I. have this I found my guy. <laughs> yeah. So along the way, after that, man, we we just found every excuse and every way in the world that we could play together. And I would say that with all the drummers that I've been lucky enough to play with uh, in my life, I've probably played with you more than anyone else. Well, I think you and I have played. We've played hundreds of gigs together. At least uh, maybe. <laughs> Thousand. Uh, May, I, I, that's no joke. Probably thousands of gigs we played together over the years. We've all we always looked for a reason to. Well, hey, what do you need? Well, I, I've got a bass player. Yeah, and that's it's the same it. same thing for me. Same thing for me. So, um, so as we're recording today, I see in the background, uh, see your one of your beautiful kits. Um, do you have a studio at your at your place? I do. Um, real fortunate to have a studio in the basement and actually it's two rooms this is the this is a drum set room and then across the hall is my percussion room and oh so, wow and i can do uh it's all linked up through the magic of the bluetooth and the uh uh cat5 cable and so i've got yeah i've got I, I've, I've got 24 physical inputs in the studio I, I usually record up to 50 up to 14 or 15 uh, drum stuff on the drum set. You know, I've got, you know, room mics and all that kind of stuff. And then over there, I've got uh, mics on the kungas and mic on the percussion thing and overheads and mic on the, uh, I've got a, a, a gong bass drum of all things. Really? Yeah. And then I've got a, a djembe mic top and bottom. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really, um, I did the, I, I did this because it was just like this room. We had this room down here and it was a, this is a, you know how they call it, like some rooms. If you don't have a closet, it can't be a bedroom. It's just a room. Right. Well, this doesn't have a closet, but the room across has a closet. So at first I just had this. And then when the pandemic hit, I'm like, man, I need to drag the roto toms down. I need to get all this stuff down here and mic it up. And I had gotten a really great deal on an expander because I've got an X32. I got an expander, an X32 compact. So I have an expander on the other thing. I got a great deal on it and then just decided to to make it so because we weren't doing anything in the pandemic. So, Well, in that, I imagine that makes, number one, it uh, opens you up to be able to pull it, to have a variety of instruments, obviously. Mm -hmm. And number two, it has to make life a lot easier because you're not having to break down a drum kit and then set everything back up. You mm -hmm. just move over there. Right. I just walk, just go over there. You know, I, I used to record tambourine and the, on the two overheads above, but I'll just walk over there grab the iPad and grab the chart and switch, 
you know, switch it to the different bus over there. And then I can, I have a set of headphones and a little mixer over there that I've got for the mix. And I just play tambourine, shake or whatever. And just, it, it's, I cannot say enough about, you know, what, 20 years ago, you, there, you would have had, had to have all kinds of things to do this. And now with Bluetooth and digital recording, I mean, I, I, you know, it's really cool. And I get to do it for clients. Um, you know, a lot of guys have rooms, but they don't have room for drums. Yeah. And so I've got a, you know, I've got a client in New Zealand, actually, that I cut drums for. Really? Uh, yeah. And you send it Dropbox and they pay you PayPal or Venmo and, you know, done and dusted. It's oh, awesome. That's great. It's very cool. Oh, I would have never thought. And I'm still learning. I mean, I, I use logic and I, but I have to tell you, I'm probably Scra- just scratching the surface on what I could do, but because I don't, I don't EQ anything. Well, I EQ the sub kick and I EQ the bottom snare mic. I, I put a little uh, high pass filter on the bottom snare mic to keep the kick out. On the uh, sub kick, I, I roll everything off above eighty, but everything else is flat as a board. And let them do whatever, whatever they processing want. once they get at the tracks from you. Yep, 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 yep. And it's just been easy that way. I mean, somebody asked me, said, well, you should, what, what would you charge to mix? I'm like, man, that, that's, that is not my gift. Man, that, that is a, that is a whole other thing that, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I, I wouldn't even want to assume the responsibility of doing that. And, and, and you know, it is, it's, it, it is a whole, it is a different set of tool it is a, and, and it's a different ear So Yeah. It's just like playing classical. I, I love to play classical stuff, but it's a different set of chops. Yeah, it it, it is. Uh, it's a whole different thing. So, so you started. I'm assuming you started in a like middle school, elementary school playing percussion. Tucker Elementary School. Okay, Tucker uh, Elementary. In in uh, with Don Erdman was the band director. Was the director, and of course he jumped around to different schools in the in Perry. We lived in Perry, Georgia. And my dad and mom bought me an Acrylite. Yep. Okay. I still have it. It's out there on the right. I oh, have that's cool. Original Acrylite. And uh, started, uh, I remember, ba, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba. <laughs> and the Haskell Horror book where they Hask- made, yes. made you hold it. It looked like you were trying to do the death grip on the sticks. <laughs> Did you? So, yeah, I started on the Haskell Horror book as well. That's where uh, that's where it started for me. Were you playing traditional grip with a tilted drum and everything, or, or was well, it a flat snare drum? I, if I remember correctly, it was probably tilted forward, but it was, it was, uh, it was, I mean, you know, the, the, the picture they show in the house of horror looks like the guy's choking the stick to death. <laughs> it really I, does. It, yeah. It's just like, we can't get this thing to work. This is, and, um, I worked on it a little bit. I kind of gravitated when I started playing drums, I started gravitating more to match grip and there's that debate. I just think that, you know, I, I love traditional grip and I, I still play it, especially if I'm doing brushes. Mm-hmm. But I'm a match grip guy, pretty much almost everything else. Well, and, and you know, we, we could probably spend the rest of our time today talking about the two schools of thought with that. And, and yeah, okay. there's there's a place for each. But for me, and I'm, I don't, I'm curious to know your thoughts on it, why utilize two different sets of muscles and try to make it sound the same? Uh, now that yeah. said, that yeah. said, George, there are people like our former teacher, Mr. Jack Bell, who can just play like no one's business while playing traditional grip. So uh, there are, I think there are exceptions to it. However, yeah. for, for me, match grip always just worked better for me. I think also the, the, the logic that I always used is that the reason why they came up with traditional grip is because the, the, the drummers had that, it tilted their snare on their leg. And that's, right. that's how they had to do that. And the other thing that I always run into is like every other instrument may, unless you're playing the only time I would like, maybe if you're playing concert bass drum and you got to go over it like this, mm-hmm. but every other instrument utilizes a, some form of match grip, you know, French grip, whatever, but it's match grip. And it's, it's like you said, if you're wanting your hands to be similar or equal, you want to utilize the same muscle group. Now, what was funny is <laughs> you laugh I mean, it's funny you brought this up because I saw a video of Buddy Rich talking about it. He's like, well, that's all right if you're going around the drum kit. you But the left hand falls this way and the right hand falls. And I'm like, no, it really doesn't. But I get it. So, <laughs> you know, so whatever, man. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think that after we're dead and gone, people are still going to be having the conversation about the difference between using match and traditional grip. I, I agree. And 
you know, you look at Dave Wickle and Dave, I mean, just f- does phenomenal things. But I've also seen video of Steve Gadd as of late playing match grip because, you know, him and Steve Smith, because as they say, as they get older, it's just easier. That, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, Dave moved back to St. Louis. Yeah, I heard that. But you get to see, do you get to see him any? Yeah, I've gone to see him. He was he was doing a uh, he was kind of doing a tour warm up, and we went to see him. And it was like fifteen bucks to to see him play. It was so good. And he has a big band up here now. Man, he's when he played at um at the Velvet Note with Oz Noy, he was great, and he was real oh, nice. Yeah. He was a real nice guy. Um, yeah, he's so good. So real nice guy. So. He said, you want a picture or anything? And you know how I am. I'm like, no, man, I'm good. This, I, I save everything up here. I don't have to take pictures of everything. Yeah, that's it. Don't need an auto, let me have an autograph, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys, man. He is he is still improving his craft. Just every t- every time you hear him, every you time. can tell he has something new in his toolbox, and it's it's just amazing. And it's scary. Yeah, it is scary. So. Yeah, it's scary. So, so you... I'm, so you moved to middle school. We're still playing. Um, um, did you? When did you? Did you have a private teacher during any of this? When I around uh, after seventh grade, uh, the way it was structured in Perry at the time was, and it was really weird. Some elementary schools went to sixth grade. Mine did as well. Yeah. Some of them only went to fifth grade, and so the one I went to went to sixth grade. And then you, for seventh grade, you went to Perry middle school and Perry middle school had sixth and seventh grade, but I only went there for seventh grade. And that was when I'm, when Mr. Alford, when Bill Alford came and he took over the band program. And so after the seventh grade year, then you go to junior high school. It's not like that now, but junior high was eighth and ninth grade in Perry for some reason. I don't know why, Wow, well, that's the way it was, and then high school was tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grade in Houston County. So anyway, so junior high school, beginning of my eighth grade year, Mr. Alford said, "Have you thought about taking private lessons?" And I was like, "Well, yeah, I'd like to. I don't know of anybody around here." And he said, "Well, I know a guy. His name is Ken Gallagher, and he's the principal percussionist for the Macon Symphony Orchestra." And so, okay, and so we looked into it, and uh, he was teaching in Warner Robins, so that was the next next city over. And I started taking with, with him and I was going through, went through the Haskell Hard book one and two, the rudiments. And then we start on the uh, Wilcox and 150, you know, yeah. and, uh, that, and we did all that. And Ken, it was, it's so seventies, man. Ken would be in there smoking <laughs> <laughs> in the studio, just smoking. And he'd play and uh, he really helped me with my traditional grip better. Cause he, he taught me a little bit about it, about trying it, you're not clamping the stick down. And then we worked on timpani and, and I had made district all stay all honor band and so forth. And then I, um, I think that was my ninth, was it my ninth grade year? No, it was my 10th grade year. Um, I was still taking lessons with him and I was marching in, in, you know, I was marching in the band at Perry and I was, what, what I did do, what was really cool is the high school at Perry had this show called Showtime. And it was a musical review. And they did everything from Moon River to another opening up and then all the way through current stuff. And it was a really big production. I mean, they had people dancing. They had, they had at one point, they had square dancers, the whole nine yards. And they did it in the auditorium at Perry Elementary, which was just about to fall in. To be honest. <laughs> it, was, it was bad. But uh, doing that, I got to do that my eighth grade year because the drummer at the high school had graduated and didn't have anybody else. And Mr. Alford wanted me to do it. And that, like I, I had to play Stevie Wonder. I had to play, like I said, Moon River and just all stuff like that, uh, all that jazz. And that was really good training ground for learning just different stuff. Yeah. Had you been playing drum set a lot before that? I had been playing a little bit. Um, I, I had joined a band called Silver Sky, and okay. we, but we had a band. It was a ba- it was a really weird. It had it was a we had a guitarist, we had a keyboard player, we had a bass clarinet, a sax, and a trumpet. The bass clarinet was the bass guitar. It was really it was really strange, but it was cute that we played. Like one of the songs we played was uh, the Eddie Money. Save it for a rainy day, but we he, they had written an arrangement for it, and it was. It was, we played a grand opening at this uh, shop 
at this little mall in Perry, and I was I was hooked. That's it. Yeah, I was hooked. I was like, well, this is good. <laughs> and then we 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 pared it down to a three or four piece. And my dad was the pro at Perry Country Club, and we used to do play at the pool at Perry Country Club two or three times a year. R- uh, yeah, man, it you were betting. That was it. I was I was all I was like. And we, I think I got made fifty bucks or something like that, and I was like, "Oh, whoa!" Yeah. So, so that was that was it. That 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 was it. And so, yep. But yeah, and then the thing after that was the next thing that happened. I was in high school, and I went to see a drum corps show down in Valdosta. I saw Spirit of Atlanta, Sky Riders, maybe Bridgman. I'm not sure, but I was just like, "Wow!" And I went to the souvenir table, and it's like, you know, you can audition for Spirit, and I was like, "Whoa." Okay. And I had been to Troy State University band camps two years in a row. And the first year I was like, it was not, I was, had a lot of work to do. But the second year came back and I had practiced and I'd been, you know, I had worked on my hands and Ken had helped me in the whole nine yards. And so I was on that snare line for that camp with Sam. Oh my, I want, not Sam Douglas. I have to remember his name, but he was the percussion guy at Troy State. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, Sam, Sam, Samuel, Sam Frederick, Samuel Frederick. He was the percussion guy at Troy State. And uh, I, so I went and auditioned for Spirit and actually made it, <laughs> you know, and I was on the snare line for one day. I was, I was 15 years old. I was on it for one day. Were you terrified? Yes. Not to mention the directions that they had given my mom said 285 West. And we were supposed to get off at 285 East at uh, Memorial Drive to go to Avondale High School. And my mom was pissed. She was very, very upset. Me and my friend from uh, Perry, Joe Barker, he auditioned as well. But the audition was actually at Sprayberry, but our first rehearsal was at Avondale. And we drove around this round 285 like once or twice. Like Pasquale Perez? Mm-hmm. And mom was pissed. She said... And when I got there, I said something to somebody about it. I said, hey, man, um, the direction said 285 years. I said, yeah. That's all they said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like they, they must have heard that so many times that they just finally stopped caring about uh, they, 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 being, they cared, feeling bad. Yeah, they cared not. So. Who were the instructors at Spirit at that so, time? That was after Float left. That was the year Float left. So it was Mike Back and Randy Wickstrom. Were the Randy was the bass drum guy and the cymbal guy. And Scott Brown actually taught, but um, Mike, that was his first year. Um, he had been uh, teaching with Tom in 81. He marched, I think his last year was 79. And then he finished his degree at Moorhead State and then taught with, with Matt. If I'm correct, now I, I think this is right. But I know he taught with Float in 81, and then he became Caption Head in 82. And then, of course, Mike was just I, – I think probably Mike had – had, and I only marched the one year, but Mike had, had so much influence on me just because, for one thing, he was he is the most laid-back guy in the world. He certainly is. And he's just chill. He's chill. He, he, we were talking about – it's like, man, what if you have kids? And I name my boy Kickback. Yeah. <laughs> But he he every he lives he lives close by and he's come to see me play with Mike Veal and just been super nice. Um, my stepson who passed away in two thousand, I actually got I the guy Mike was just great. I I sent my, I sent Mike an email. Uh, Andrew had just left Florida State and had marched in Crown and in, in Carolina Crown. And I, I called Mike. I said, hey, man, would you consider just meeting with Andrew, see if there's a place for him on your staff at Walton or whatnot? Just just do that. And he did. And turned out Andrew was a real asset for him. And um, that he did that. I, I I asked for a favor and he gave it to me. So I'm just I think the world of Mike back and Andrea, too. I think the world of those. Yeah. People. And well, and he is just the the reach of his influence. Uh, in the percussion world, will could probably not be quantified. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is. There are so many people that he has either directly or indirectly uh, instructed and influenced. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, like it, you know, like the Jack Bells of the world. I mean, same I would, thing. I would say him and Jack and Mark Yonchic, probably the and Ken Gallagher. Those are the those are my four that I just got so much out of. But yeah, so I may I March Spirit in '82 and then. Then we moved in the middle of my junior year 
we moved to Conyers, Georgia. And that facilitated my marching. It was easier to, to go to spirit rehearsals to do that. And, uh, you know, then I marched at Heritage and Heritage had a good band program, had, had a great band program. So it was it was it was going from Perry had a good program, but it wasn't like Heritage. Heritage had a top had a top five in the state, probably in the in the country at the time. They were really they were playing level six music, which lot not a lot of bands at that time were playing all level six music. Yeah. No, it was it was you know it was it you was played good. you playing snare on the drum line and and then doing the, snare on the drum line and then we had you know it was funny because Perry and I say this with all due respect Perry we didn't have anything we had like two or three timpani maybe and they were old and we had band room we had band in the cafeteria nobody gave Perry was the redheaded stepchild of Houston County and it's not like that anymore I went back for my fortieth reunion of all things and. They've got not one but two band rooms. They've got a band room just for the drum line. What? Yes, they have a band room just for the drum line. They got big band room, sort of big band room for the drum line. And they've they've got it going on, man. It's beautiful over there. But you know, that was the same thing for me. Uh, you know, I started at South Forsyth when it just opened as a high school because Forsyth Central had they had overgrown the the capacity of the school, so they opened up a second high school in the south part of the county. And the band program and the the budget and the instruments, it was just an afterthought. Basically, almost the entire time I was there, no no good timpani, no good mallet instruments. I mean, we were just kind of having to just kind of figure it out on whatever we had. We we had we did not have a concert xylophone, did not have a marimba. I had never seen a marimba until I moved to Heritage. And they had one of those uh you know the ones the the four not the not the the, the four octave ones with the smaller bars. I, it was a it was a musser, um, but it was a I want to say it was Imperial or something, but it 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 was I'd never seen that before. And what we did for for mallet instruments at Perry, we just took the concert, we just took the marching instruments, put them on a thing. Yeah, that's we did for the xylophone. We had one of those, I guess, two and a half octave marching xylophones, and that's what we did. Yeah, that's no it. Chimes, no chimes, no, you know, at, at, and at Heritage, I think they had four or five timpani. I was like, whoa, yeah, oh, but yeah, but it was it was cool though living in Perry. My dad, I actually got the idea, and I my dad helped me make timpani mallet really yeah but they, they were they were we'd take a dowels and we glue the my, we would glue the ball on there and then you take foam and and wrap it and and just foam but then he what he would do is he would take leather golf grips it must have i don't know what it cost leather golf grips and wrap the ends of them i wish i still had some i don't know what i don't know what i did with those that was so i mean probably got lost in the move and all that yeah how did they did they sound good i Nobody ever complained. Oh, shoot, I was 15. I got my own balance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it beat, uh, you know, my dad, for all of his good things, he was, he could be a cheapskate. You know, I, I the funniest thing that I have to share this story. The fun, So he said, I think it's time for you to get a drum set. I'm like, all right, cool. And I had the Ludwig catalog. One, mm -hmm. uh, he said, just show me what you want. And we'll go from there. So I went to the stainless steel drum set, 12, 13, 16, stainless steel, right? And then, of course, well, I got to have Zildjian cymbals. So I put together a list, and he, he took it, and he gave it to a buddy of his who was a Spalding salesman. And then his buddy, in turn, ran Ideal Music in Atlanta, Ira, Ira. Ira called him up. He said, he said well, Henry, I got, a, I got your boy's list here. <laughs> said, how good a boy is he and dad said he's a pretty good kid he said is he six thousand dollars good and he said no <laughs> my dad called me down to the pro shop i'll never forget it because we lived really close and i used to go down there and pick up golf balls and whole nine yards and he said he said i got your list back from uh the guy over in atlanta i said yeah he said you know how much all that stuff costs i said no, sir. He said, $6,000. And me, I went, okay. He said, I'm not spending $6,000 on you, George. There's no way. <laughs> so I got this Pearl Ruth, one of those off-brand made in Japan things. And it had a rack tom, floor tom, and a 20-inch bass drum. And it was wrapped in silver. Hence, And then that's why we called the band Silver Sky. And oh. it, matched, it matched. My dad was like, it's going to match the the snare drum already got for you, which it did. And then he had to special order a, th a 13 inch Tom for it. And then he would go to pawn shops and pick out symbols. 
I had a crut, you know, I had a crut. So, <laughs> and I had something else, and, but it was, you know, it, it was, it was, uh, it was, that was what I had. But yeah, I tried to, I wanted a, a stainless steel big beat out of the catalog. <laughs> Six thousand dollars. Six thousand dollars. I don't know how much those drums weighed. Oh, I, I, we had some. We got some stainless steel marching drums. Some of the snares, and that was when you had a sling. And I just remember those things being heavy. Oh yeah. I imagine, I imagine a bass drum was just. I can't even imagine. Uh. Uh-uh. And again, we had bass drums that matched, and those kid, those guys wore straps. And uh, I just those guys wore straps, and I can't imagine what they weighed. I just can't. Oh. You- People experiencing permanent back issues from years in high school carrying those drums around. <laughs> you know, Scott Brown played. The, um, we talk about Scott. He marched in spirit when they had the seven triples and then the four. And he said his back still bothers. Oh man! You know, so yeah. I just <laughs> golly, the things you do for love. That's exactly right. I remember Scott Brown. Uh, when I knew him was when he had great Southern percussion. Yep. Yep. Him and yeah. Leon Burdett. That's right. Him and Leon Burdett and Kim Lloyd. Yeah, that's all, right. All three gentlemen and scholars. I love those guys very much. I Absolutely. Talk, uh, every so often he's funny. And Leon is a pastor in, in a church in Alabama. Really? Yeah. And Kim, Kim is a, we're both, Kim and I are both fellow Bama fans. And so we've commiserated the other day about the loss of our coach. Oh, yes. Yeah. Those guys are, those guys that great Southern percussion and they had great Northern percussion, if I'm like, I know they had great Southern. Maybe they did away with great Northern. I don't remember. But when I was in eighth grade, I started taking private lessons with Tim Howard. Oh, yeah. Um, and Tim was close with those guys. And okay. that's how I met them. And then they used to have, they used to have the great, southern day of percussion which is kind of like a pas event we would always go and take a percussion ensemble and and play for those things oh man we had that that indoor yeah i, I took heritage uh a couple of years so yeah took the, that was the drum line that i ended up work so i ended up we're fast forwarding but i ended up being the percussion instructor at heritage for about 10 years and i took those guys to the indoor thing and that was when you know drum lines like villa rica and stuff they were really into the indoor thing. And and it's a, now it's a whole different thing, but you really had to think. I mean, it was a different thing. You had to think, drill in the whole nine yards. Yeah, I remember the Cleveland High School from Cleveland, Tennessee. They were they were at that time. That was the best high school indoor line I think I had seen. They were unbelievable. Yeah, they just they have. I don't know what the, what their program is like now, but they were the only. As far as when I was a senior in high school, we beat them band wise, but they spanked our butt drum wise. Yeah, and that's you know. Uh, so I have to ask this question as we're talking about DCI and indoor drumline, and um, this is when this is when you and I are allowed to get on our soapbox of about a few things. Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts about the state of drumline and rudimental percussion and all of that? How what are, how are you feeling about all that these days? I got to tell you, there I, I'm. It's a paradox for me because there's this guy who I follow on uh, on either. Instagram or whatever, he always has these hybrid rudiments, you know, and I'm always like, okay, I want to, I want to learn that. Now, I don't know how that, that's not going to come into play much when you do this, but like the, you know, I like that. On the other hand, you know, I, I'd really like to see less props. Mm-hmm. The props thing has gotten out of hand here. And, um, you know, the last show, I think Phantom did a show last year and I really liked it and it had minimal props. And I know that it's become more like B- Bands of America and all that stuff. And the activity is going to change. The problem that they're having right now is because I'm I'm a Spirit alumni and I donate money every month to Spirit. It comes, I don't even see it, it just goes. And um, the problem now is it takes so much money to compete. And it's not just even, um, I mean, props cost money. You can recycle that stuff, but fuel costs and transportation costs and food costs, you know, you've been to the grocery store lately. That's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to get $8 eggs. It's unbelievable. Yeah. You can't, you can't go. It's impossible. I think to go to the grocery store and not spend a hundred bucks. It's impossible unless you get one thing. And even that one thing, it depends on what it is. So, as far as that goes, they've got, I mean, I, I see this stuff on a daily basis. People talking about how, how are we going to be able to cut costs? And, you know, last year, uh, Santa Clara was inactive because, yeah. they, you know, Spirit was inactive two years before because they it was just, there was some things. It's, it costs, 
a lot of money, especially if you're on the West Coast and the championships are in Indianapolis, you got to get there. Yeah. Blue Devils don't really have – Blue Devils are the exception. I'm sure it still costs them money, but Blue Devils are the exception, and I hope that SCV comes back like like they have. I just think that at some point – I love the state of rudimental drumming. I mean, those kids play stuff that I just – I never even thought about. Do you practice much? Mm-hmm. Or you Is it – mostly hand stuff or do you practice drum set stuff work do you work on things you're interested in a lot of what i do is hand stuff if nothing else just maintenance i have practice pads all over the house much to everybody's chagrin you know i have a practice pad in the living room so that you know and it you know it sits there and i've got one down here in the basement i've got i've got then i've got two in my little other side of the studio over there i always travel with one and so i'm all i'm I try to do at least 30 minutes a day hand stuff. You know, um, I will, I do come down and do drum set stuff. If there's if, like, if I feel like there's something weak or whatever, the, the challenge I have these days is that my right knee is just bad. It's just oldness. You know, uh, as Dr. Albert says, I have worn out my bearing. So I try to, I, I will do some work with my foot, with my feet and do some practicing stuff and try to learn, try to learn some new stuff and, Really try to do that, but I will tell you that if I'm not playing and I have a long week ahead, I will take that time to rest. Sure. And just do right and just do hand stuff. I always do hand stuff, you know, because that just to me is I can I can always do that anywhere. I mean, I bought one of those uh, Drumeo foot pad thing. It comes with a beater and it, it sits. It looks like a little trigger and. I, I have I have not set it up in the living room because I have a feeling Shella would kill me. But, you know, <laughs> but, but I do, ha- you know, and and there's grandchildren and they're just, you know, into everything. So, yeah, that would just be a, an immediate thing for them to be like, oh, I'm going to play with this. <laughs> they, all play, they all play with poppy sticks. And, they, you know, I've got a little set of those mini LP bongos and they like to play with that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah, man. But, uh, yeah, so I do practice. I still practice a lot. That's I, I was, fantastic. You went to that Peter Erskine clinic, didn't you? No, I wasn't able to go. Look, um, well, it was so funny to me because he was, he's so soft-spoken because he's got tinnitus for one or tinnitus or whatever you want to call it. But he's so soft-spoken. And he was talking about this session he did for Seth McFarlane. And he said, it's a big band thing. And at first he was just reading through the stuff and he played just quarter notes it. And then he went back and they cut one and he started doing the ding, ching, a ding, ching, a ding. But he said, I, I don't, I don't think, I, I think I need to go back to what I was doing. And Seth said, sure, man. And so he went and play, he played quarter notes on the ding, ching, ching. And that struck me because one of the things he said was, had I not taken a second just to get away from the, I wouldn't, I would have tried to play spang, spang, lang, you know. Uh, he gave me a sticks, by the way. I still have a pair, have a pair. Really? Of oh, yeah, it was awesome. Oh, oh that's awesome. Yeah. You know. And look, I think the, and as true as it may be, the term playing to the song is very overused. I get it. But it is amazing how we tend to get in our own way about some of those things. And maybe even at that moment, he might have been feeling the, well, I'm playing a swing thing. So apparently the the expectation is that I play the standard ride cymbal pattern that (laughs) everyone feels that I'm supposed to play. And no... That's made, That's probably not what it needed, and he had to get out of his own way. You know, I did a session the other day. We were doing this slow country thing, and it was, you know, but that just felt like it felt too busy. So I went to, and it was really slow. So I'm playing to a click, and I'm now I got to concentrate. This, mm-hmm. you're filling in the holes, but now you got, but but in, in the truth, this, as simple as it was, Playing side stick and then playing in the courses was what the song needed. And I yeah. went back and said, I need to do this again and just just let me just have it again. And I just you have to let you have to get out of your own way. That's really it. Yeah. You know? it, and it's, you know, musicians tend to overthink, get in their head. And I would even say there are a lot of times where I play defensively instead of just relaxing and doing what I need to do. Well, I'm gonna tell you, you I don't know of a time that you've ever not played what's right. Oh, gosh. I mean, seriously, as long as we've been together, you know, in the couple of sessions that we've done, we, you know, I remember what what's his name? Eric was like, man, you guys don't need two or three takes. I'm like, yeah, I know, because Brad is awesome. And, and we just lock in. And 
you take away, you know, if you take a, this is a weird analogy, but if you take a piece of meat, right, a, a nice steak, and you keep just enough fat on it for flavor, cut all the rest of that fat away, you're going to have a great piece of meat. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you take a big slab of beef and it's got all the fat hanging out off of it, it's going to be, it's going to be heavy and it's not going to taste as good. So, and I, I look at like playing that way. It's like, okay, what's the, what's the shortest distance between making this thing groove? What do I, what's the, what's the best thing I can do to make this thing groove? And a lot of times it's just take away all the extras. Take, take it yeah, all away. It, that's exactly right. It's, it's knowing when to use the pencil and when to use the eraser. Absolutely. Right? absolutely. We, we did a play with a guy named George Hughley uh, for Thursday night at Blind Willie's. He's 80 years old, man. He's, he's dancing and he's, it's incredible to me. And we did a um, lion to the races. I'll tell you, and I played side stick the entire time only because it seemed to work and he never asked me to pick it up or whatever. And the other guys playing seemed to like it. And, it just seemed to seem to work. And there's, I just think that eventually you have to get down to, yes, there are times when you blow and there are times when you, can you give me more and all that? But I tell you, the thing for me is, has been most of the time, nobody wants to really hear that from, from me. They want to hear, they, they want groove and I'm okay with that. That's fine for me. Uh, well, you know, you groove as well as anyone, anyone. No. And then in, when it's necessary to blow, you can, you can do it again as well as anyone, George. It's just, wow. it's I, unbelievable. I, it really I, is. I, I think that the one thing that I like to try to do, this is one I, I was thinking about the other day. The one thing I like to try to do is uh, instead of playing these big fast fills, I will try to go like a, uh, play a, a three against two or something like that. I do that a lot. And I don't know whether, what that is, you know, you know playing long and then do like, a, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know why. I don't, it's, 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 well, it's, it's rhythmically interesting and it, it does change up for just a moment. It just kind of changes the feel of everything. Just a little bit. And yeah, that's awesome. And, and you get, you do it, you, you get it out of the way and then you go back to, to groove. Yeah. But yeah, but that's, you're very sweet to say that. I look, I am a byproduct of who I play with and, I've played with some great guys, but as I've told you, playing with you, when we played that first gig, it was just, it was like, and I always say this, it's like slipping on a pair of of blue jeans that you've worn for a while that aren't worn out, but they just fit your body and it's boom and you're good. That's exactly, that's exactly it. That's exactly the way it is. Um, And, and I, you know, I've said this to you a hundred times, but I'm going to say it on here. So it's, it's recorded. Okay. For the record, awesome. that <laughs> that you managed to play every song with the right feel and tempo for me as a singer. It every we play a song one time and we we figure out where that tempo and feel needs to be. It is going to be that way every time from then on, and it is so easy to be a bass player and a singer when you're the when you're playing drums, man. It is just. It is a complete pleasure. Well, you you're a sweetheart, and I'm, I'm a, I will tell you where I started, where I got that from, and I'll tell you where I got that from. And this is I read an article with about Greg Bissonette. Greg was talking, and he was at some tribute thing, and it was him and Steve Gadd and so forth and else. And, St- and Greg was all worried about backstage and blah blah blah. And he went over to Steve, and Steve was sitting there, just kind of looking up at looking up at the ceiling and singing something and clicking the sticks. And Steve went, "Greg, how you doing? You all right?" He said, "Yeah, I'm a little nervous." And and Steve Gad said, "Yeah, I'm just wanting to. I'm singing the song so I can fall right, so I can get the right tempo of it." And so now, whenever I'm playing a song, I I don't I don't know if you notice this or not, but I will sing part of it. If nothing, I'll just like you know, just try to sing a a a, a line or something. And then if that thing feels right, because to me, if you're playing in a vocal group, if you're playing where vocals are there, that's, I don't care what you can have your ego about it, whatever. Vocals are the main, that's what people listen to. That's what people gravitate towards. And if you, if you are singing, if it's too fast and you can't get the words out, then, then you, you failed. If it's too slow and it sounds like a funeral dirge, 
you fail. But yeah. if you've got it to where the vocals sit right where they're supposed to sit, then you've succeeded. And that's the only way I do. I, I literally will, you know, sing something, sing a phrase of the song before I count it off. If, it, if I don't do it just in my head. Well, and we talk about playing to the song and that conversation typically is about playing fills or playing groove, but not enough attention is given to the tempo element of playing to the song. Right. And thankfully for all of us singers out there, you have a great understanding of that and know what is required in order to really make this, to give the song its justice. Well, you're, you're a sweetheart. And, you know, I, maybe the other thing that helps is that I do sing a little bit. I mean, I, I certainly don't fancy myself a, I'm a drummer who happens to possibly sing a little bit. I mean, you're, you're a fantastic singer. I love your voice. You could sing the phone book and people would be enthralled with it and, and don't even sell yourself short that way. Cause they, cause they love your voice. I've always loved your voice, but if nothing else, I can apply that. You know, I've got to sing, you know, Johnny come, you know, Johnny come lately. I've got to sing that phrase and it's got to be in time. If it's too fast, then new kid in town sounds like we're off to the races and that's not what it's supposed to be. Yeah, no, that's it. That, that's it. And, uh, well, on behalf of all of us singers wow. out there, thank you, George Sandler. Oh, you're, you're a, you're, you're a you're fine, a, fine gentleman. You're <laughs> You're you're a great guy, and you know, like I said, the one th- the, one of the other things that that I, I love about your playing and your vocals, but there's there's a lyrical playing to your bass playing. There's is a roundness to the tone, and you know, it, it's just again, it's just this groove thing. I know that this. I hope that whoever hears this doesn't think that. I mean, if you think that we're this is the mutual admiration society, well, it is because I adore brad i adore his playing and you know i hate that he's in st louis <laughs> so, i know man it's you ain't know, in I, st louis that's right exactly <laughs> so so i'm trying to think of how to set this story up so in the early 2000s mm-hmm. i was playing and i think you probably were too we were orbiting in different universes but we were both playing a lot of those radio promotions for the country stations yes. in Atlanta. That was a big thing at that time. It was a big old, it was a huge thing. And 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 kudos to what was it, Kicks and Eagle? Yeah, Kicks and Eagle. Especially Race Week. Yeah. At the, at, they kept all I mean, they we they had radio remotes almost every night. Every yeah. Night. Oh. So I was playing in a band with Tommy Dodd and uh some other fantastic guys. Yeah. Mike, uh, Mike Johnson, yeah. Um, and you were playing with Tim Purcell and the Mustangs. Yep. And Mike was not available to do a gig at one point, and Toby Ruckert subbed for Mike. So okay. that's how I got to know Toby. Yeah. Just a fantastic guy. Oh, what a great guy. And so you guys had some gigs coming up, and it was for race week. Right. There were two, it was two back to back gigs, and down in like Stockbridge. No, this was in Jonesboro. We Jonesboro, have- you're right. You're Jones- right, George. Right off a terrible Boulevard. Jones- that's ex- that's Ooh, it. Moly. Yeah. And so, <laughs> does so they called and asked if I could sub for you guys, sub for your bass player. And um, I think the first one was it like at a Kroger or something. What the Kroger? It was it was outdoors. Yes. And it was it was in the evening, I believe, and. Kyle Petty came Mm -hmm. and people were standing around the damn block holding doors and tires and everything else for him to sort. I mean, there was a guy standing there with a hood and a door. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. They were all getting his signature on. Yeah. And And they were giving away race tickets, which was just so that, yeah. So the second gig was at another place. It was at a Eckerd's. It was at an Eckerd Drug Company. That's right. Yep. Yes. And they were giving away. You know where I'm going with this. Oh, I know exactly where. You, I, <laughs> they're giving away race tickets, and I guess this woman thought that she could sweeten the deal to maybe get race tickets. And um, oh my god! So we had finished. All right. So we had finished. Remember? Yes. We finished, the, and they had this big wheel. I don't know if it was Cadillac. Or it wasn't rhubarb, but it was one of the radio personalities out there, and they'd spun. We you spin the wheel and you get tickets. We had finished. We were almost packed up. This is how I remember. Maybe you do this beat up 
cream colored rust covered folare. <laughs> and it's creaking and it backfires. Pow! And they park. And these three people get out. God love them, man. I mean, holy moly. And one of them's carrying something, got her, got her arms cold up. Y'all still giving away tickets? <laughs> And it was like, no, ma'am, we're done. And Toby, Toby, I don't know what made Toby go do this, but Toby said, she's carrying something. I'm going to go check it out. I'm like, okay. And he went, whoa, it's a goat. It's a baby goat. This woman brought a baby goat to this event to try. I don't know if she was going to try to bribe them. uh, It was traded in for a some tickets, but she brought a baby goat. She brought a baby goat, and she said, she said, well, I brought my goat. I named it Jimmy after Jimmy Johnson. I named it Jimmy. He's our favorite driver. And he had been there. If I'm right, he had been there, and he had already gone. That was when he was on the the Bush circuit. He was driving the little the, the Excedrin car, something like that, if I remember. Because I got two little cars that I gave to my boys, and I wish I had them now because they were autographed by him. They probably... You know, whatever. But he had left. She said, is Jimmy still here? <laughs> I was like, no, he's gone, man. Well, I brought him a goat. Oh, well. I just would love to have heard the conversation that led up to that. Them thinking that was the best idea of the day. We can't the- leave the baby goat alone. We just need to bring it with <laughs> He ain't going to make it by himself. But you know, we, we probably, we could parlay this and some tickets. That's <laughs> exactly right. Needless to say, they did not get tickets for their effort. And and it was, God love them, but they were three of the most unusually unusual looking. That lady came up in her like muumu. She was not even wearing. She was wearing her house coat. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm. yeah. The two dudes that got out with. I was just like, mm-hmm. yeah. So twenty plus years later, we are still talking about that uh, about the day that we got to. Uh, that was the second. It was the second day we knew each other, yeah. and we got to experience this gal uh, bringing a goat to a radio promotion. Baby that was goat. crazy. Baby goat, man. And, and what was what part was fun about? It, Toby went up to her and touched him. Went whoa, like his hand, like he burned his hands. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Like, wow, you know. I mean, he literally pulled his hands back like he had burnt them. It was, yes. Oh, it was hilarious. It was I, hilarious. You know, we've had we've had so many fun fun time on stage. We had um when we, we used to do these things at good old days every Sunday. We did that for a while. Yeah. And out on the patio, if it wasn't out on the patio, if it was raining, we did it inside. And we had such a good time with it. Now this one wasn't one this was with Kenny. Kenny played on this one, the one where mm-hmm. we did the we had we would just do all kinds of things and we were doing a Hungry Heart Springsteen. And we just kept playing the four the chord changes over and over again. And we um, we started singing different Bruce Springsteen songs. And, you know, I think I sang, uh, your hometown. And, <laughs> and then, some, and then Brad, <laughs> Brad went, you better watch out, you better not. <laughs> and we, the three of us, just lost it. We never stopped playing, but we were laughing so hard that we could barely play. And we, that was the funniest thing I think that has ever happened to me on stage. Besides that, that was, I don't know what, where you pulled out Santa Claus is coming to town, but you know, and the, and the people around us, they weren't laughing as hard as we were and we no. don't care because it just, it's like, here we are in the middle of July or August or whatever it was hot out outside and Brad goes, you better watch out. <laughs> oh, it was hilarious. That was, that was great. So. That was I. That is probably the funniest, the funniest moment I've ever experienced on stage. It was so because it was just so silly. Oh. It was so much fun. I, you know, the other memory I have is from that patio was when that woman kept coming up requesting songs. Yep, and she got be she got she got to be a pain in the butt, and but we'd have to say anything. Mm-hmm. What do you in the audience do? Someone took care of it for us. Um, th- yeah, she just kept wasn't tipping. And it was like every song that we played for her, she then came up and asked for another one. And it was one after another, one after another. And finally, someone in the back of the patio, and it was packed. There were so many people there. Benevolent soul. Someone screams out, you're not that hot. (laughs) Sit down, lady. You're not that hot. And, And 
And we, everybody, everybody, including us, went, ooh. <laughs> and, and she left. She left. She made her exit, which was, I don't know who that was, but if you're, if you are the person who did that and you hear this message, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for saving the day. It was oh, so Lord. funny. And then, you know, we had, we played, we played a bunch of church gigs together. Um, we played at First Baptist Alpharetta. Uh, the two things, uh, we shall remain nameless. We had a guy who was serving as the interim worship leader. And every, and, and it was, it was just nuts, man. We, we would do a traditional service and um, a modern service. And the traditional service, I would play percussion. We would have a percussion set up, set up, and we'd go through that thing. <laughs> And then we go and do the strike all that and do the modern worship or whatever. And this guy, we would we would do these rehearsals, and it was it was it was better than even money where he would be on stage in the middle of it and not do what we rehearsed. And we'd all be sitting there going, "What is he doing? What is he doing?" And so one Sunday we decided, "Uh, uh-uh, we're going to stick to the chart. We're going to play this thing, and if it goes off the rails, it goes off the rails." And he, I, it was this. Uh, Oh, it was that Israel Houghton tune. Um, and he wanted to do six bridges. And it's like, what? When five bridges just won't do. <laughs> when, when four bridges just won't do. <laughs> and it was like, uh, okay. And then we, we so, okay, we'll do six, sure thing. And I remember he did four or five and went into the chorus. It was like, nope, we are staying right here. We are in bridge six, bro. You know? <laughs> and, then, and then Kobe, uh, <laughs> Kobe. He was standing next to Brad. I sent Brad this picture. I still have it. Kobe's sitting there, and he draws. And Kobe is Kobe Rossman was a great uh, acoustic guitar player, just a great guy. He's drawing something on his sheet music, da, 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 da. and he snaps a picture of it, and he sends it to all of us. And it's this, it's this figure of this horse with the cr- eyes crossed, and a guy with a with a bat <laughs> beating a dead horse, and that all just got us. And we were we were laughing. And they were up there, welcome to First Baptist Church of Alpharetta. And we're sitting there and we're laughing. I mean, we, we've all got our heads down like this because he, he sent it to all of us. It was, that was hilarious. The other thing that happened, do you remember the time we were playing and they had had a concert and they had taken down the partition, the booth, if you will, for the drums? And it was all while I said, man, this thing's not going to hold. Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I'm like, I'm telling you, it's not going to hold. But okay, it's fine. And in the middle of the last song, the sides collapsed and this thing fell, the roof fell on me and I just ducked and it flipped. <laughs> and we never stopped playing, but I was like, I told you guys, this thing is, this is not going to hold. I had not, I, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. and the band played on, you know, the, the, the Titanic is singing, sinking, but and, and the band played on. Brad's got his head down like this. <laughs> Cause he's laughing and I'm, I'm like, oh my God, that was that was that was priceless. We we could have been uh we could have been a viral sensation on YouTube. Oh man, someone had captured where, that yeah, moment. Where was the where was the capturing? I mean, that guy who got hit by the cross that fell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, man, it, we've had a lot of good times playing together. Um, Brad shared a recording. Now, where did we? Where was that? That was it. So that was at Terra Humata. Um, we didn't yeah. speak anything. Everything sounded. So, I was amazed at how good everything sounded. So I just would bring a little Zoom recorder, and I would. I don't know if you remember, but above the bar there was a little bit of there was a ledge, mm-hmm. and I would at the beginning of the night I would just turn on the Zoom recorder and sit the sit it up there. Wow! And it would just pick up everything in the room. That that is to me that's a testament to that that piece of gear. And also I I will say this, a testament to the three of us, you Brooks and myself, that we just balanced each other. We just, it was a balance there. You couldn't have mixed that. That's like straight to two track. That's it. There was no mixing to it at all. It was just, it picked up everything around it. And uh, yeah, just picked, picked up the, the way we were mixing ourselves at the, at that moment in a loud, very full, Bar. In a in a loud, very full bar with people, you know, talking because you can you can hear the people in the background talking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so we started. You and I. I don't even remember how it all started. Um, I guess we had done some trio things. We, you and I, have been very lucky to have a trio and work with a very great variety of keyboard players from the late Gene Gino Lesage, yep. who 
just was amazing. Mm. And then uh, Kenny Head, of course. Right. Um, and then we played at Terra Humata. And I don't know if you remember this, but uh, Dave Schleesman played with us a few yep. times. I remember Dave. And then Nate Fink played with us once. Nate Fink played with us. Yep. And then um, Brooke Smith, who um, I met playing in uh, Live and Large with. Yep. And then you played with. I, I remember the first time you met Brooks was you were subbing on a Live and Large gig. Yep. And I remember we were doing sound check and you and I were started playing a song and Brooks looked over at me and he was like, Oh, well I can tell you guys have never played with each other before. Surprised <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny, man. Brooks is Brooks is such um I mean he's got perfect pitch and, mm-hmm. and that alone but he he's such a um, such a great musician. I mean, he he played with a band called The Grapes in Atlanta, and he's been with a he's got a, a thing called the Yeti Trio, and they play stuff way out there stuff, just out yeah. out out there stuff. But he he just the three of us, and then again, this is not belittling any of the other keyboard players we play with. Certainly, we had great times with Kenny and you know and other guys. But the three of us sang well together and played well together, and we enjoyed the same music and it was just it was just again another instance of having a, a nice broken in pair of jeans and just putting it on it just felt right from the start that's exactly it and we we were lucky to be in that venue playing because they kind of let us just do our thing and we it we had a lot of friends that would come a lot of musicians would show up yep. and we just kind of did whatever we wanted to do Yep. Um, it, whether, whether we thought it was a good idea or not, we would try just about anything. I'll never forget. Let's be in like, Hey, let's do band on the run this weekend when yeah. we play, or let's do, uh, let's do turn it on again by Genesis this weekend. And we just would show up and, or we would be in the middle of a song and you would have an idea to, Hey, let's go into this song right in the middle of this one, or I'm going to sing this one right in the middle of this. And it just worked. It, it did. And it's one of those, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, but I, I, it, it is one of those things that it, it's just symbiotic from the start. And and that doesn't happen all the time. You play with great musicians and, and it works. But when you play with, when you have that relationship and that, and that thing that just locks from the, from the very get go, I mean, gosh, we did that wedding up in a, up on that hilltop for the Stinson. Yeah. And I mean, we, we, we went on tour. We loaded my van full of gear because we had to have everything. Had to go. Was that in North Carolina? Where was in that? North Carolina. And, we, and, and we had to come, it was in part of North Carolina. We came back through um, South Carolina. We stopped at that um, Fuddruckers on the way back. That's right. You know? So uh, it, it's, um, it was a lot of fun. We were on tour. It, it's one of those bands where, well, a couple of things for me. Number one is that we could go and you can go and play for the musicians in the world mm-hmm. and play some stuff that maybe people aren't used to hearing. Or we could go play a wedding and play all the standard fare that people wanted to hear. Right. Uh, the other thing about it for me is that at the end of my life, when I think about my musical journey from a 30,000 foot view. Right. That's going to be one of those things that stands out to me is my experience getting to play with you guys because it 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 truly is one of the highlights of my life getting to play music. Me too. I, I, I can I everything else I shouldn't say has paled in comparison, but in a way it has. You know, I, I've played again. I've played with a lot of great great players, but there was something about that that was really special. And you know, it was it was just a lot of fun. It was it was just great and man you know i think that i again you know things where there were i, I hope we're gonna I'm, I'm i really want to try to play some this summer with it and, and see if you can i know that you gotta you got your thing and you in st louis but we'll figure something out oh absolutely and and we're not we're not far away we can do it and and i'm i'm banking on the fact that we're going to we're gonna put the uh, put the old band back together the old band back place, and um because it it was just too special not to um, revisit it, and if anything, just for ourselves to just have some fun because it was so much fun. It, it, I, I can't imagine anybody having more fun than we did. I, I just mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I just you know I, I I just can't imagine anybody having more fun than we did because we we laughed. We were always laughing. We were it was glad that we were glad to see each other. The band sounded good, and it was just it was effortless. 
And that's, yeah. where, you know, if, if, if anybody's listening to this and you want to play in a band, when you know it's right is when it's effortless, when you don't have to put, I mean, you have to think, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? When, when it's just, you just play and, and that's when it's right. That's it. That's exactly it. So yeah, man. Yeah, it's great. So I know you've done a, a ton of sessions over the years and I'm just curious about you playing drums in a recording studio versus playing at a live uh, in a live situation do you adjust your approach differently for those two things or where what is the overlap between the two and what are the differences between the two well okay so it's funny you should ask i try to look at a session and try to play it as i would live because it's going to have energy does that make sense Mm -hmm. but I will I, I will even edit my my playing even more in the studio a lot of times but um I think I really try to uh, I, I really try to capture try to capture what I would do live in a studio I don't want to be that different does that make sense um, yeah, it does absolutely I think that that for something to sound fresh it should not sound robotic and if I have one complaint about any some of the Steely Dan stuff that I've heard over the years, it sounds robot. Some of the stuff sounds robotic, you know. Yeah. But like you listen to uh, Doctor Wu with with Picaro and Jeff just play. You he know what played, I mean? yeah. And, and so that's what I try to do in the studio. If it's something, and and I will try to, um, I always try to get my stuff within a take or two so that it's fresh. I know that you hear stories about you know take after take after take after take. And I just think that that just squeezes the ever loving life out of us. Yeah. You know, I think, yes, the studio is that place for trying to get everything right and perfection. But I also think there's gotta, there's still gotta be a feel to it. There's still gotta, it's still gotta be that it's still, you're still making music. You're not, you're not doing a math equation. You're still making music. And so the only difference I would say maybe is, and I haven't even done this lately. It used to be I had a separate set of symbols for live and a separate set of symbols for studio. But I think pretty much I use the same sort of thing. You know, I use a pretty much use a 22 inch ride, maybe a 23, one of those sweet rides, uh, 15 inch hi hats these days. I use those live and in the studio, and I will swap them out. The crashes are bigger. Um, you know, with the, I, I try to, just try to approach it to make it as fresh sounding as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. I don't know that I adjust anything. I might, um, I even use, I mean, I use the same sticks, you know, there are some, there are some drums that I will only use in the studio only because that I'm paranoid about them getting hurt live. Mm -hmm. How many, uh, how many snare drums do you typically take to a session? Well, okay. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> at Tune Designer, I keep them. There's about 18 snares that I keep at Tune Designer, and I always bring about six or seven with me. So, if but it, it got ridiculous at one point. I have to admit, like when I was having to bring my kit and everything else, I'd bring at least 12 snare drums, which was insane. So now, if I go to do an outside session from Tune Designer or whatever, I'll bring. I'll try to think high, medium, low, and then maybe two other, like something. Something like a five five inch um, high you know higher pitch snare medium six and a half uh, then maybe for a low pitch I'll bring a seven or an eight and then maybe something something in between two other things maybe a wood and a metal so well and as I was talking earlier about your incredible ability of man of playing the song just at the perfect tempo for the singer you also have a really incredible ability to listen down to the reference track or to the demo and pick the snare drum that perfectly fits the song where we'll start tracking and i'm like yeah that's exactly what the song needed which then leads me to think how important does the sound of the snare drum dictate the overall vibe of the song it is it is i think with if everything stays the same let's say you keep the same time same symbols and everything else the snare drum can change the entire kit. Whatever mm-hmm. snare drum, it, it changes the vibe of the entire kit. Um, like I'll do here lately, what I've been doing is that there's a couple of female vocalists I work with, and I try to get snare drums that are out of their vocal range, mm-hmm. which usually means lower. So that way it's not clashing. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I just try to find something that fits in the voice. I'm certainly got, they used to do things like in the, I heard that those guys were tuning their drums to G's and A's and stuff like that. I don't have the temerity to do that. that no, 
that would drive me kind of crazy. But I don't, I will tell you this, I'll take enough snare drums to go, well, can you tighten it up a little bit? I'm like, well, no, let me just grab another drum. Because I, I have found, I don't know about you, but I found that a snare drum lives in a certain range. Mm-hmm. And there's a sweet, I mean, you can go up or down from that, but there's a sweet spot that that snare drum gives you just a mind around a ring. There's just a mind, just an amount of fatness and so forth. And then you can muffle and do whatever. But I would just like, if somebody says, man, I need a bigger, I need a bigger sound. Can you crank that down? No, nope, I'm just going to grab another drum. Yeah, I'm going to grab another drum. Because I just really feel like drums live in a certain spot. And, so, yeah, and there's nothing, there's nothing more frustrating than here's someone that just, over tunes a, a snare drum and just Ooh. just chokes out all the tone of it. It just it that's one of my you know I'm in a Yamaha user group because I'm a big Yamaha fan now and Yamaha at one point made these drums with the small I call them the small chiclet lugs or just the squares and these guys would just they just crank the drums down they're trying to get a six and a half inch snare drum to sound like a piccolo and that's not going to work. And, and you're going to end up damaging the drum. And the, the, the lugs popped off and all that. And I'm looking, and there's the, the drum head is actually above the rim. The bearing edge is actually even oh more above the rim. It's like, dude, that, you're, it's no wonder. Uh, I just, I actually feel, I always tune, if somebody asks, and, and there's a couple instances where it's different, but each drum of mine is tuned to a medium tension, and I let the drum dictate the voice. Now, I do have an 8 by 14 inch uh, recording custom birch drum that I have on the, on the, I have it sound like eagles, you know, birthday cake stuff. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, everything is medium tension, not extreme high tension, not extreme low. And a six and a half inch snare drum, brass snare drum will sound this way, whereas a five inch cherry drum will sound this way. It'll sound higher because it's a small, it's a, the size of the drum. I just dictate that. That's, that's, yeah. that's what I do. So how much do you think, and I know we're getting into the weeds a little right. bit about this, but I, I think it's fascinating and I'm sure a lot of people are curious to know about this kind of stuff. How much do you, how much weight do you put on gear versus touch for the tone? Um, yeah, I here's what I here here's a good example of that. Remember, you know Wilson, right? Wilson Brass. Mm -hmm. Okay, so oh, yeah, I, I I've heard he had somebody come up and sit on his gear. Remember that, and it sounded okay. But then Wilson played it, and it sounded totally fatter and and the whole nine yards. I think I I, I do think that yes, gear is important. I, I, I will absolutely say that. However, I will tell you that you can take a a less than expensive drum set and put good heads on there. And it's more about what you have in your, it's, it's more about a touch. I, yeah. I just totally believe that. I, I think that, you know, when, you know, when we were being trained in the class world, you're, you're taught touch, you're taught how to lift and, and draw the sound out of a drum. And I, I try to still do that in playing drum set and whatnot. I, I definitely think touch plays a huge part, you know, great gear is great gear. And, Everybody makes great gear these days. I, I, I'm serious, but the difference to me is, you know, I've heard people play. I'm, I'm real funny about people playing my cymbals because I think that that I heard this from Peter Erskine that he feels like, and I kind of agree that cymbals get used to a way that the molecules are moving, and they get used to a certain touch. And when you when you go away from that, it gets kind of weird. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so, yeah, I think touch is extremely important. I, I think that, you know, especially if you hear like guitar players and stuff, man, there's there's a huge difference in, yeah. in guys like that. I mean, I've sat in, I, I've gone to hear a band and sat in to play bass with them. And without touching a single knob on the rig or on the guitar, it sounds completely different. And it's just, it's in your hands, it's in your touch, and it's just in your note choice or, yeah. you know, it. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it, yeah. it's, um, I, I, if, if nothing else, I, I, one of the things I strive for is to make a be make a nice, pretty sound on an instrument that is not known for making nice, pretty sound. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, a cymbal is not, a crash cymbal can be real harsh, but I think that you can still make a pretty sound on it. You don't have to, you don't have to just hit it lightly. I mean, if you make a nice crash, it's still going to make a pretty sound if you hit it properly. Well, and you, you also understand the idea of each limb being like a fader on a console and that 
you have to mix your limbs and you have to mix the instruments on the fly to get the right balance of kick to snare to toms and and then maybe even you're also your own compressor in that you have to it's you you be more consistent as you strike the drum so it doesn't have to be required of of who's mixing it you don't have to move all that stuff i will tell you this and i'm certainly not one to toot my own horn because i don't like to do that but a guy who's an engineer friend of mine uh named mark balsigler i had at one point i had put a a a gopro camera up at the studio at at tune design and i had just let it run and i posted it and he made the comment he said man that's just the gopro video he said and how you mix yourself it sounds like a it sounds like it just sounds like a drum set it doesn't sound like hi-hat here and snare here and you know that that fiddler crab thing remember we what's his name Jack Bell used to talk about it, fiddler crab, where your mm-hmm. one hand was louder than the other. And if 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 I've done nothing else over the years, I can at least do that. Oh, come on, man. You yeah. do it so well. No, and- I don't know about that. But I do I do take pride in that, that, the fact that I want the instrument to be balanced. And, you know, if it's a different, if it's a louder snare drum, then I may back off a little bit. Uh, if it's a certain groove, I may want to, like, try to, like, some of that R&B, some of that older R&B stuff, you want a little bit more hi-hat. You know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But in everything, and this is what I always grew up hearing, with jazz, it's top down, ride cymbal down. With rock and especially, you know, funk and all that, it's bottom up. Bottom up. Yeah, that's right. So there. So what, what is, so explain for to the fine folks about t- <laughs> Tune Designer and what that what that is and what you guys are doing, because it's a really great, cool concept. It, it is a cool concept, and I'm just blessed to be a part of it. John came up with this thing. John Johnson, he's the guy who owns the studio and owns Tune Designer. He came up with this concept to where we, and John's incredible, man. John's got a, you talk about an ear on this guy. He can take a vocal. So we get all kinds of demos, people singing into their phones, all kinds of things, people. And and he'll come up with chord structure and melody and so forth. And what we do is that we do have people in the studio, but most of the time we don't have people in the studio. So we'll get the demo. John will do all the pre-production and we'll come in and we'll cut their song. And either they can cut their vocal where they are, or they can come in and cut their vocal, and and we do that. That's what that's it's we, we give songwriters a, a chance to have their song professionally recorded, and by the time it's all done, it's radio ready because his his uh, net red is mixing and red is uh, red Johnson his is John's nephew, and he went to he graduated from Georgia in the uh, in the music. Uh, uh, I guess production with a music production degree has a great ear and he mixes it. And that's what we do. I mean, literally we've had songs we were talking about the other day. We had a song, this lady sent a song in about her dog. It was a, he's part wolf. And so we came up with a song called wolf and uh, it was, it was really kind of neat. John's got a real good imagination. And again, he, you know, we chart, he charts everything out number chart for him. And he can, that's a five, that's a five, seven, you know, or five, whatever. He, he just does that. And, and we just go in, the three of us have played together as almost as long as you and I have played. Together. And so it's, it's, uh, it's you, John and is and Daniel Addison, yeah, Daniel Addison. Yeah. Daniel great player. Bass. He's a great player. Dan, but Daniel play, play, plays bass and then he's got, he plays guitar. And what mm-hmm. I'll either do is, so I'll try to get mine on the first or second pass, and I may go back and overdub a tambourine or a shake, or maybe right now we've got it set up to where I've got an electronic setup, and so we're doing some of this new country stuff. You got to have the the snaps and the claps and all that stuff. Ugh. But anyway, <laughs> I've got a little bass drum pedal, so I can do the eight hundred eight thing, and we'll mix that. Um, and Daniel will overdub acoustic. I mean, we've got a resonator guitar there. We've got uh, the Nashville. The one tune to like the Nashville thing where the high the upper string mm-hmm. like tune on a twelve string or whatever, and then he's got a, a a baritone and so forth, and then Rhett will either Rhett plays steel and he plays dobro, and so we'll do it. The only thing, only instrument we can't do in house is is fiddle or violin. You have to send that out. But um, well, if somebody wanted a dither, a, a zither, I'd have to do that. <laughs> right. But, how many? How many? tunes are you guys cranking out a, a day per day yeah it's nine or ten but it's we can do that because we we the reason only reason why we can do that brad is because we know each other really well and john has done the pre-production mm-hmm. we may make a you know and we ask a lot of questions like well the client 
uh, can you give us an example of a song that you hear this being like? And so they will. And that gives us, oh, I hear kind of a Blackberry Smoke thing. Okay, well, that's easy. Got yeah. that. And so I'll pull probably a brass snare over and think that way. Think real, real, you know, that sort of thing or or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and so that makes it really easy as far as that goes. So, yeah. You know, and that's great. How many days a week do you do that? We do, we, we do Monday and Tuesday every other week, every other week. And so that's cool. And then every, like we do these things called tune ready tracks. So we'll come up with a track that doesn't have vocals on it and somebody can buy it and put their vocal on it and claim all the rights and everything else. It's their song. It's their thing. So what a, cool concept this is I, and i think so and yeah and i don't know if other i don't know if other producers and engineers around the country are doing that but man that's just a because i know it's hard for songwriters depending on where they are geographically to to get good players that can deliver their idea of the song the right way and uh through this and through the magic of technology, they can send it and away you guys go. Absolutely. Now, I will tell you that that most of the time, we, like John will get something. And if he feels like it's something we can do, he'll do it. But now if it's, you know, if it's, first of all, he won't do anything that's, you know, got bad words in it, for lack of a better word. He, 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 he just won't. John John's never had a drink in his life. He's never done any of that. I mean, he's just been, he's, his. He, he's played in church all his life. He played in Southern gospel. I don't think he's ever played a, a club or whatever, but so he's very convicted as far as that goes. Um, but he, uh, he, 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 he will pick out if, if somebody sends something in and they go, okay, this is in our wheelhouse. We'll do it. Um, but he's had some, John would, he, he wants to do it in a timely fashion. We are not going to sit there and beat a dead horse. You know, mm-hmm. if we have to go and fix something once or twice, that's fine. But if it requires a lot of fixing and the guys change his mind, blah, 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 John would just rather just give his money. But look, man, I don't think we're right for you. I'm going to give you your money back. That's that's great. You know, and 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 I I I commend him for for standing behind that the principle of that. I think so too. I think that you know we've all been there. We've had I had I'll I'll play drums for anybody, but I had a I had a client recently that I do stuff for in my studio. It just got to be kind of ridiculous. It, it just got to be. And I finally said, listen, man, you know, and then, then he said, well, I got a guy who will do it for 25 bucks a song. I said, well, then he's your guy. He's your guy. He is absolutely your guy because I can't do it for that. And especially with having to go back and correct everything. And that's part of the downside of not having people in the studio. You know, you if we did a session once and I thought we were done. I mean, it went on. It, it was late. It was the last last song of the day. And they had come and we had played. And I'm like, okay, I've played my stuff and I'm just waiting in my room. And I'm finally like, okay, well, I'm going to pack my stuff. I'm going to put my in-ear monitors up. And, and I came out and said, well, are we done? And the lead singer said, I was thinking about some feel. Uh. At, at, I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, okay. And I mean, I, you know, it's like what we always say if there's people in there. We set the tempo. We set the key. Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Yeah. Because at, at this point, once we finish it, going back in course, there's always exceptions to that rule. I don't know. Did you ever hear the story about Boys of Summer, the, the Boys of Summer song that they had yeah. finished it and they were in the studio celebrating Nico Bolas and and, and uh, Don Henley. They had finished it. And Bob Seeger came in. He said, man, that's great. Why? Why did you, you should sing it higher. You, people, women love it when you sing it higher. And he was like, oh, no. And, and Don said, what can we do? So Nico had made a tape of the track and they went to Don's house all weekend and they found sing it higher, sing it lower, sing it higher, sing it lower. And finally if they came up with that version, they had had they had, had it finished. You know, it was a Lin it was a Lin nine thousand track that, 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 that all that drum stuff. But you know, hey man, you should sing it higher. And well I guess when Bob Seeger tells you something, you should you, you should pro- probably listen. listen. You know, but it's like you'd done all that work and hey, you should sing it higher. Girl girls like it when you sing it high. <laughs> Who who co wrote that song? Um, uh, Mike Campbell. Mike Campbell. I was trying to remember who. I thought it was Mike Campbell co wrote yep. that song. He had that song for Tom Petty, and Tom Petty did not want it. Man, there you go. <laughs> who, who knew? Who knew, man? <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, with with the ten designer stuff, I've been very fortunate. John has been really good to us, um, and it's and it's good stuff. I still have stuff to do. You know, I will do stuff for them occasionally 
on weeks that we don't have stuff, if somebody comes in and they want a thing, I'll do stuff for, and I'll send the files to them from here on this thing. But normally we do everything there. So and you get to leave your gear set up and you just kind of roll in and they, do it. Yeah, they've got a, um, I acquired a pearl fiberglass kit similar to the one I had, but it has a 24 inch bass drum, 12, 14, 16 inch toms. And then I had some side racks that I had used on one kit and I just got tired of them. So I brought them. And so everything's in place. I walk in, um, I even have a pedal. I walk in and I'll bring a couple, a few snare drums with me, but, and we'll go. I even have like innovative percussion is who I, who I use for my sticks and um, have a great relationship with them. I have an endorsement with them. I endorse their sticks and they send, you know, I have them send sticks there so that I don't have to bring sticks from home. It's perfect. Wow, man. man. That's a great, <laughs> what a great, uh, pretty sweet gig to have. It is you know? the only bad thing, Brad. Oh, getting there. <laughs> well, that, but Covington, if you're listening, your options for dining on Monday nights are limited at best. <laughs> <laughs> and you can only eat Longhorn just so often. The Applebee's there is not great. The Mystic Grill there is overpriced and not great. And, you know, everything else you're taking a chance on. Trust me. Just- well, I, I'm sure with the, 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 the far reach of this podcast that the fine <laughs> folks with the Chamber of Commerce will certainly get s- something in their uh, suggestion yeah, box. We'll see. They, see. they have a great restaurant there called City Pharmacy. And it's really great, except for it's not open on Monday. Come on now. Oh, man, I'm serious. They're not open on Monday. So, you know, I don't know. Anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's. It, I've, I've been real blessed with that. And I've got a good uh, – the people who I work for on a regular basis, I work at Mount Perrin, play with the youth there. And I really like playing with the youth because I can go just like this. And for those – this is not video, so you guys don't see, but I'm wearing an Alabama hoodie and – jogging pants and i'm dressed for church that's great we do three songs and it's awesome and they're good folks and they i'm the oldest i am the oldest guy in the building hands down i'm the oldest guy in the building but they're they i love playing with those guys is this mount Perrin central or north central central i've never i've never even been in the north campus never even been i think i played there one time maybe two times yeah I'm um, also a sub for the big room. That's what I call it. But, you know, I'm really content to play there. And then I've been working with uh, our buddy Kevin Wyglad at Creekside. Mm-hmm. You get to play with Brooks. Uh, he plays bass there. Yeah. And he, and I think sometimes he plays keyboard and sometimes he plays guitar. You know, it's uh, it's too bad that he's so multi-talented that he uh, he's just kind of a Swiss army knife, whatever they need of him. He's, he's such a great guy. He's so funny, man. So, yeah, I, I'm real... I have some real good relationships with some some good people. I, I you know last year I played at the at up at the casino up up at uh, Cherokee and that was interesting. Um, but uh, you know I, I think I'm not playing with one band in particular right now. I don't know that I I'd like to, but um, the landscape has changed a little bit though. So you know it's a little bit. And I you know I moved right in the middle of. COVID and didn't kind of didn't experience the live music scene after everything reopened. But I've heard that, that since then, just things are different as far as who has live music, what kind of live music, what they're doing. It, yeah, it just seems to be a very different landscape than it was before. Uh, it's different. And I will tell you that if I hear, well, we're still trying to recover from COVID one more time, we'll smack somebody. <laughs> it's, it's now 2024. Okay. It's been four years. All right. Let's COVID COVID for the most part is over. Although that my, my daughter-in-law and my granddaughter got it over Christmas. Um, but it's, it's, there's that. And I think that there's a tribute band thing going on, the, 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 that thing going on. And I, you know, I have my feelings about that because I was in a tribute band. I did the cheap chick thing for a while. Um, but, and I like what we did. We had a, we haven't talked about this, but we had a Beatles cover band. We were not a tribute band. That's right. It was not, it was never meant to be, nor was it ever a tribute band. It was a cover band uh, where we just played the music. And we just, we loved playing the music because I, I, Brad and I are both huge Beatles fans. I think, yeah. you know, if, you know, so, but anyway, so I think that there's the, the tribute things going on. Why do you think that that's such a, is it economics? Does it allow a venue to kind of feel like they're getting a big name without having to pay for one? I think that's absolutely correct. And you know, you got you got bands that 
you know, Tom, they, there's Tom Petty tributes out there. There's John Mellencamp tributes out there. There's journey, a journey tribute. There's a, a, a great, you know, departure. I mean, Oh, they're great, man. I mean, and that guy, uh, Brian, he's sing he, he nails that stuff and they sound awesome. And then there's a, um, a, a friend of mine named, uh, Bevan Davies. He owns a, a, a holistic, not holistic, but a pit stop for pets, but he's the drummer in Zozo. And buddy, I got to tell you, if you want to see Led Zeppelin, besides going to see Jason Bottoms thing, mm-hmm. those guys are, hey, Bev's got the orange drum set and the orange, the orange vis lights and everything else. I think it's, I think it's that. And I think that, you know, the people who want to spend that money, you know, remember th- these, these are people that don't, ex- some of these bands don't exist anymore. You know? Or, or the original band has kind of become their own tribute band oh, because yeah. There might be one original member or zero original members, That's or they have a new lead singer. I yep. mean, it's incredible. It's, you know, you got to hand it to bands like Ario Speedwagon, who still have a few of their original guys, especially their lead singer. You know, Loverboy, that guy's still out there um, doing it. Sticks, they sound Sticks, great. They sound great. And boy, did the, I saw them at, when we played at the casino. They were playing up in the event in event room, and they sounded amazing. They're just they're just incredible. Um, but you know, all of our heroes are, are my all my heroes are in their seven. Yeah, it's I remember back in like twenty seventeen eighteen, there was a wave of losing a lot of our heroes, Ooh. and I I worry about that. Ha- it's going to happen again. I think that I, I want to make sure that Paul McCartney's wrapped up in cellophane. <laughs> You know, and Stevie, yeah. Stevie Wonder, and you know Elton John, and I think also too that it's real important that at some point you step away. You can't, you know, you can't do this forever. It, it, that's it. What do you want your legacy to be? And and the way you go out is, I don't want to be remembered for being uh, a has been. I don't you know? either. I, I, and I've told my family that if it, and and I'm, I think I'm honest with myself enough to where. If I felt that my playing was slipping, then I would just go, you know what? It's been a good ride. You know? Yeah, it's, that's it. And I think that it's important to do that. So, yeah, the, the landscape of the club thing has changed. Um, some clubs that existed don't exist anymore. That's just, you know, it, they just don't exist. They've, they, they didn't make it through COVID. Or, they've, or the club has changed their target audience and changed who they're, the clientele they're trying to attract. And that dictates the kind of, entertainment that they book yeah it's it's frustrating sometimes it really is it's it's um i don't know about you i don't go out as much anymore no. I, I you know in fact on gigs where uh <laughs> on gigs where it's late you know the cool thing when i was playing with mike is we played till like 11 mm-hmm. all the time but like you know that whole adage of nothing good ever happens after midnight and I, it's the truth and i think also and i'll say this and if you're not live music fan out there I may not be talking to about you, but I may be. Um, th- people are, have the the pandemic did not do anything for keeping folks sane, and and I'm telling you, people do crazy stuff these days. They they will walk on stage or just behave badly, and I just man, I don't, I, I just don't want to have any part of that. Yeah, I and I don't go out very much. Um, especially to hear music, but I just read about these stories of these entertainers that people jump on stage or they throw things at them. It's like, folks, stop it. Yeah, just, just, and, and it's not even, even at sporting events too, people do just silly, silly things. And I, I, I just would, imp- I, I implore everybody to use your head for more than a hat rack. <laughs> the, the, you know, just, just try to try to do. Think to yourself: Do I look good in stripes or aren't? Because <laughs> folks aren't playing around anymore. No, and, and, and I well, and I think the other part of that too is we live in a viral world where social media and your fifteen. It's not even fifteen minutes of fame. It's like fifteen seconds of fame yeah. now, where someone is just wanting to be the top the top video on YouTube or TikTok or whatever yep. that the kids are watching content on these days. And and I think that that's the motivating factor for a lot of these really silly decisions that people make. I, I don't disagree. I saw something the other, on this long, long line. I saw this meme the other day. If the Titanic would have happened today 
and it has all these people in the water hold their phones up, videotaping, you know, the, the boat capsizing. It's like all these guys in the water have their have their phones and they're capturing the video of the, of the ship sinking instead of, you know, and then freezing to death. But they got to capture that video. You're exactly right. That's exactly it. So, okay. look, I, you know. I love social media. I, I think that it can be used good and bad. I definitely think that there's a whole lot of pluses to it. I definitely also think that there's some some stuff that should not be attempted. But there you go. I agree 100. percent I I'm agree 100. percent I am old, so there you have it. Yeah, we look. We I do feel like you know I'm more and more turning into the get off my lawn guy, you know, Ooh. and the one of the old guys on the Muppet Show. But it's okay. <laughs> hey, listen, I I am known in the neighborhood. And I live on that corner there with a four-way stop and people blow through that four-way stop. And I have gotten on the Fox Hall side and said, swear to God, I'm going to buy me a paintball gun and sit on my porch and go and light up whoever's passing through that stop sign. <laughs> so do it. I just, you know, I'm stop it. So, stop but, yeah, it. but yes, I just, um, I have to tell you that I'm flattered that you wanted me to do this. I really am. Yeah. And I I just can't thank you for all of the years of camaraderie and music that we've made together. And I hope that there's more. So. Well, George, I feel the same way. I have, you know, it was like when I was lucky enough to get to meet you and start playing music with you and build a, a friendship with you. It, I mean, it, it changed the path of my life. I know I, and I, I don't, I'm not overstating that when I say it, that it's just you've inspired me to, to be a better musician. And, and I'll always be grateful for what you uh, what you've been to me. Same here, man. And I, and I got to tell you, I am so proud of your son. I, I really am. I am so proud of him. Um, I think that, you know, I remember when he was little and coming to gigs and it was, it, I'm just so proud of him. I think you've done, you've done well with him and Sophia. They're, they're just wonderful little, wonderful people, man. Well, I feel the same thing about your crew. I mean, it's, we all kind of, when, especially when we were really, really playing a lot, it was like a big family affair. We were all seeing each other a lot and, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're like extended family members to me. I feel the same way about your, your kids. Same here, man. Same here. So, um, but you know, life, life is good. I think that if you look back on this and we go, man, we got to play music with people who we love. And play a lot of it, and and make a decent living at it. We've done okay. That's it. That's exactly it. We've done okay, man. Yeah, man. We have done okay. I can't complain. Well, George, I love you, buddy. I, you. I can't thank you enough for uh, spending the some time oh. just reminiscing and talking about things. This is uh, this has been a real treat. Did we cover everything you wanted to cover? We did. We did a great job for part one. Okay. Well, we're gonna say that, and uh, we're gonna do a. We have a lot of other things that I want to talk about okay. down the road, yeah. um, and um, we're going to make that happen sooner than later. You know, all you have to do is call. That's all you got to do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, buddy, I love you, and I, I appreciate it. I love you, too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Bandwitch Tapes. I'm your host, Brad Williams. The show's theme is called Playcation and was written by Mark Mundy. Drop me a line at the email address, thebandwitchtapes at gmail.com. Make sure to subscribe to receive new episodes of the podcast. And while you're at it, please tell someone else about the show. Thanks for listening.